We are recording. And hello to everyone who arrived in the middle of my explanation. Uh, Dan, do you want to take the lead on the discussion again? I felt like that, that went pretty well last week. Could I ask a question before we start talking about the paper? Certainly. Yeah. Uh, so I've been looking a lot into lean and uh, and I know you guys use Idris for a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm just wondering why, why pick Idris over lean? Is there, mm -hmm. is there a practical reason or is it just kind of like you had to make a choice that was the choice and kind of had just have just proceeded? I found Idris a while ago and I have never found the time to look into lean. I've heard some things about okay. lean that make it sound really cool. Yeah, and it's, uh, I don't remember specifically what the property was. They they had this really nice comparison between all of like um, these proof assistants on Wikipedia. If I, if I find the link, I'll, I'll share it with you guys. But it seemed like Lean had the most robust um, kind of like feature set out of all of them. Um, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll send it uh, if you can. Yeah, I think um, Lean I is really close to Coke from what I've heard. I've never used Lean. I mostly used Coke. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't catch that. Uh, I've never used Lean. I've mostly used Coke. But from what I've heard, mm. Lean is based on uh, calculus of inductive construction. So it's mostly mm. the same theory uh, that is behind Coke. Yeah, 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 exactly. But uh, mm. that's my impression from a few discussions I've been in. Is that mm. it? Uh, basically, they are willing to compromise on the theoretical aspects to get something that is more usable by mathematicians. Mm -hmm. Is it a programming language? Yes. Has anybody built any applications with it? Uh, not. I I am not aware. Okay. Uh, I think it's mostly aimed at mathematicians who want to formalize proofs, like Coke. Like mm -hmm. you don't really want to write any complicated algorithm in Coke. Okay, have you guys played Space Invaders in Idris? <laughs> no. This exists. Idris is a real programming language. Whoever whoever sent the last link, that was the one I was looking for. Uh, but either way. Yeah, I think from my impression, Idris is mostly a programming language, which is also a proof assistant. While Lin is a proof assistant. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, like, technically is Turing complete, but you don't really want to write anything too complicated in it. Mm. Is that just for performance reasons, or, or why? Uh, it's design reasons, I think, mostly. Design reasons. Like, you wouldn't design the programming language the same way you would design the proof assistant aimed at mathematicians. Like, uh, you don't you need the same say syntax. Say a little more about that? Sorry? I, I mean, can you say a little bit more about that? Like, I understand, you know, that's a, like a design choice, but why? Why? Well, the for example, I think the, uh, the most blatant example is that in Idris, you can have partial function. And actually, mm -hmm. by default, function and partial. You can have unrestricted recursion if you want to. While in, well, uh, I'm not sure what the situation in Lin is. I'm mostly talking about Coke and hoping Lin is close enough. But yeah. in Coq, you cannot have unrestricted uh, recursion. It's completely impossible in the language. Everything you write has to be uh, like valid in the calculus of inductive construction. Yeah, and you're, you're just saying because it's are strongly normalizable in the calculus of constructions, then you can't have these like infinitely recursive things. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not possible. Yeah. Uh, if you could right. have something that recurs infinitely, you could prove everything. Yeah, right. Because you know you can you can have basically you can uh, inhabit uh, the bottom type, right? And then and then yeah, exactly. it's a completely useless uh, framework at that point. Um, Whereas yeah, that that might be yeah. something you want if you're writing a web server, right? For example. Interesting. I, I mean, okay. in Coq, you have way to talk about uh, computation that does not terminate, but you cannot write computation that does not terminate in Coq. Yeah, right. Oh, hey. right. Yeah, in, in, okay. okay, that makes sense. In interest, there's co data, so you really can talk about 
um, sort of infinite computations in a rigorous way. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's what they do in Coq too. Very cool. So, oh, one one thing that I wanted to ask because I, Jake said this last time, uh, well, asked about Agda having partial functions, and you just said it about uh, Idris having partial functions, which I don't think I understand the point because you can take any function and turn it into a partial function by just you know making the the target like maybe or, or like. Uh, option or whatever you want to call it but that sort of idea like if it's undefined just return none and if it's defined return like some of, uh, of a value so i guess I, I don't see the the point of the the partial function so maybe somebody can explain that uh th that has something to do with um basically you've got a difference between algorithms that are decidable and algorithms that are recursively enumerable like recursively enumerable means if it accept, if the if it must accept an answer it will accept it at some time but it might not terminate mm -hmm. but you have problems that are recursively enumerable but which are not decidable which means you cannot decide whether it's not before like a finite amount of computation like you cannot convert any function that uh, that may not terminate into a function which is uh, maybe. But in practical terms, in Idris, the emphasis is on programming. So I don't want to take all mm -hmm. my functions today and make them total before I can get any work done. Mm -hmm. I don't want to prototype mm -hmm. something. Yeah, and there is also the problem that um, checking the termination is undecidable in general. So the uh, termination checker is like not perfect and some things that mm -hmm. always terminate as are quite hard to convince like Idris or Cox that they actually do terminate and if you just mm -hmm. want to write the functionality you don't really care about having Idris knowing it terminates every time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a lot more burden on the programmer right you want to verify the parts of your program that you need to verify and then you want the other parts to just yeah be Put together. Okay. I'll have to uh, let that sink in a little bit. Okay, cool. But I, I appreciate all of the uh, all of the info that you guys are giving me. Yeah, but I mean, like, if you were interested in you know writing category theory in Lean and showing what you're doing, like, and I would be, I would also be interested in playing around with that and doing some of this stuff um, in Lean as well. Mostly, I was just interested because. I saw that um, you know the the state box Idris CT library written in Idris yeah, um, yeah. kind of had enough structure there that I could kind of you know feel what was going on and had a pattern to work off of. Um, yeah. But then also there wasn't so much there that um, I wouldn't have to write any code to get all this stuff to work. So it was kind of like a perfect middle ground where I could still like write code to understand the stuff that I'm learning and make it a contribution to a library. Yeah, cool. Okay, and that's like a totally practical reason to to pick Idris over over Lean. Okay, yeah, totally understand that. Um, so so one thing that I had worked on recently, just to understand it a little bit more, because uh, reading through this uh, Lambda Calculus and uh, Combinatory Logic book, um, it's by authors Hindley and Selden. Uh, they they go into like propositions as types in the dependent um, like type theory section, and they're showing like how you construct all of these logical operators. Like um, you know, universal quantification is like basically for free because it's like the pi type, and then they're showing how to do uh, an existential operator, and then they define this operator that's like related called like the projection operator and just looking at the type that they had written in the book was like i don't think this type check so for me like the easiest thing to do was try to write it in lean and see that it didn't type check which it totally didn't and uh then i could kind of like play around with the definition that they had uh until i got to something that like type check first of all so that news uh, and also had the property that they claimed this thing had from the beginning, which uh, it, I mean, their definition didn't even type check. Um, and so, uh, okay, great. Now I have like this, uh, this thing defined and like something that can, you know, show me the types and uh, 
show me that the computations work out the way they claim. And, uh, and I wrote the authors. I was like, hey, guys, uh, I don't think this is correct. Like, uh, here's, here's some lean code to, to show that uh, it's not correct. And uh, here's, like, the thing that I think it is. But um, by the way, maybe, maybe at some point in time, I'll, I'll start looking at category theory stuff in lean as well. Yeah, I would visit. that would be an excellent blog item. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in particular, what was the book title again? Uh, it's called um, Lambda Calculus and Combinatory Logic and Introduction by Roger Hindley and Jonathan Selden. Um, if I show my screen. Yeah. So were they showing existential and um, were they showing the yeah, like that's the categorical? Uh, so they are, they are doing everything in terms of pure type systems. Um, so like with uh, dependent function types, and so they're they're just giving some definition in terms of like this pure type system, and then claiming that it has these like nice properties, like whatever thing you expect this projection operator to do with uh, like all of these things that you've defined. They claimed that it did that, but first of all, their, defin their definition didn't even type check. So yeah. we'll see, I'm, I'm waiting to hear back from the second author. The first author got back with me and was like, oh, the other guy wrote that, like I'll let him respond. So we'll, we'll see how that really goes, but um, cool. Um, uh, two things on the comparison of proof assistance. One is ACL2. That's the professor I studied under at UT Austin. He's kind of a friend. I'm not sure how he's doing. His health might have been declining. Uh, Dr. Boyer of Boyer Morph Theorem Prover. And then the other one is F star. The work there is awesome as far as they've got this uh, way of representing security properties that is really awesome. Well, that's just two notes. Um, and then by way of encouragement, I took our session last time, or our session so far, whatever, made a blog post out of it. Um, I was just talking about how, you know, turning CS papers into notation is the way I learned them, and the quantum physics gap, and my intro to Idris, and there's a recording, and uh, I, I reconstructed that figure with, with uh, graph viz and Put it in there. Nice. Um, so, in the, the, how do I get to the dang Zoom chat? More chat, and then nothing happens to my screen. So I'm sticking this in the computational calculus in the in the uh, uh, collab Discord. Now back to our regularly scheduled maybe. <laughs> Although who knows what we're really regularly scheduled for? We talked about <laughs> chapter three. Um, so, PF. Um, does anyone want to talk about dagger, dagger categories? Okay. Um, I have only one thing to say about dagger categories, and that's that I don't know what they are. Um, Jake, what are dagger categories? Uh, so, yeah, as I understand it, it's just that any morphism in a category, also there's an inverse of that morphism in that category. Um, but I guess, yeah. For, so for any every any morphism, there is an inverse. I guess I just got tripped off because then I was like, well, does that mean that every object, every time there's a morphism between objects, those morphisms are isomorphic, or I mean, those objects are isomorphic, and I suppose they would be. Oh, dagger is like adjoint. Okay. Yeah, it's not really an inverse in the dagger category. It's like. I guess it looks like uh, an inverse, but they don't write that uh, if you compose f with the dagger of f, it's supposed to be the identity. Right. Okay. Yep. yep because yep, otherwise, that, that would be a groupoid. Yeah. 
Yeah. Your brain being exactly the categories where every morphism is invertible. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Daggers are like adjoint, so they like switch the role of the domain and codomain. How is that different from where everything's isomorphic? Eh, I blew a gasket there. I, I guess the dagger construction might not be the inverse one. Like maybe you've got mm -hmm. a way to map function to other functions that preserve the axiom, which is not mapping a function to its inverse. Mm -hmm. They give an example with Hilbert space, but I don't understand Hilbert space. Okay. So. All right. I'm going to limp along with my incomplete understanding. So, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so, dagger categories are uh, the, te the terminology for uh, if you reverse all the arrows, it still works. Oh, okay. So, it's not like you keep the arrows in the first direction. You just switch the end of the, all the arrows, and it's still a category. Well, sadly, it's a question. I'm not sure if that's so, but oh. that was my understanding. Well, no, I don't think it could be because that's the just the opposite category, right? So why give a name to something that we already have? I think there was a discussion on this distinction somewhere on Zulu. Please, yes, opposite categories and dagger categories are different beasts in general. Well, here it says it. A dagger category uh, is one equipped with a functor. That is the identity on objects and satisfies that for every morphism. So yeah, it looks to me like you just flip all the arrows and then it maintains the, the definition of a category. Yeah, it's that, not that just that you flip all right. the arrows, it's that you, yeah, it's you that have you, both of them. Yeah, you have an operator on the arrows that to an arrow gives you an arrow in the other direction. So is it like I have both of those categories at once and a factor uh, between them and all this monstrosity is a dagger category. That's, I, that's the way I read this. Okay, thank you. So if uh, reversing all the arrows works, uh, then I can construct a dagger category uh, by no, taking no, the categories that's... and the factor between them. You can always take the opposite of a category and get a category. Yeah. Wait, what? Really? Uh, yeah, that's a yeah. standard construction. Yeah, like if you the reverse arrows. all the arrow, it's a composite. Uh, it's um, okay. If you write it, it's pretty trivial because like everything reverses two times, and it exactly works if it works in the initial category. Yeah. Yeah, that's there's a it's called dual category in Idris. If you want to look up the definition in Idris CT, but and they write it as C op here, right? The opposite category. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Oh, so dagger category contains in itself a category and its opposite category and the factor between them. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think if you look at the uh, the example below this one, the one with the uh, cabordism, I think you get to see maybe why it's not just reversing the arrows, but like, um, if you scroll down a little bit more, you also have to switch like the direction of the circle. What was that saying again? Yeah, because if you just uh, mm -hmm. constructing the opposite category is a really trivial operation. You don't, you just say, as hey, this function from x to y, I will call it a function from y to x, but it's still a function from x to y in the initial category. Well, the dagger category is that you've got an operation that takes a function from x to y and gives you a new, new function from y to x, but which is a function from y to x in the, initial, in the starting category. Oh, right, I see. I see, so you sort of found something in the, okay. Oh, why am I, okay, I don't want that to happen anymore. <laughs> um, all right, logic. Um, time check. I do have a constraint at the top of the hour. The rest of you are welcome to continue, but I have 30 minutes remaining. Same Sounds here. good. Um, so, and or implies not um, propositional calculus pretty familiar to everyone, I hope. If not, mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that to your own study. Um, Predicate calculus adds quantifiers. That's what it just said up there. Say again, please. That's, 
predicate calculus adds quantifiers to that, but yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, then there's this interesting thing of throwing out the law of excluded middle. Um, usually, if somebody says, "Yeah, not not x," you can get x, and this and somebody says, "Well, why why is that?" <laughs> Brower said, "That's not good enough." Um, that that kind of stuff was familiar to me. The idea that just because uh, and he, what did he say? Uh, right. One problem with this, princi this principle is that proofs using it are not constructive. For example, we may prove by contradiction that some equation has a solution, but still have no clue how to construct the solution. Yeah. So if when you get into constructive logic, now it's now you're programming. You have to write the program that that produces the solution. Right. Basically, as uh, as those proofs ca um, computable, kind of mm -hmm. like that. Well, they are programs. Proofs in in constructive yeah. logics yeah, are obviously. programs. Yeah. Up to isomorphism. <laughs> yeah. Well, not up to isomorphism. I mean, Jake is quite typing into a computer and running them. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he has the privilege of such a good language. Right. <laughs> Um, but even when you're doing crappy PHP programming, there's some world in which you're proving <laughs> things. <laughs> Let's not go here. Yeah, right. But it's a, it's a X file so system logic, right? You can prove false and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As long okay. as you've got unrestricted casting and at least one object which is inhabited, you can like. Prove yeah, everything. the logic would end up being pretty pretty goopy. <laughs> yeah. While we are uh, taking jokes, uh, my take on that was um, that proofs by contradiction are destructive proofs. <laughs> <laughs> there is a thing called explosion in logic where um, if you have P and not P, then everything's true, you know, and that's, called, mm. that's yeah. an explosive logic. And there are some logics where mm. that's not the case. There's, uh, uh, there's isn't that an initial object, basically? I don't know how it relates to, to category theory. Uh, Bartos uh, had, uh, well, he had a lot of content uh, in his uh, YouTube series introducing category theory. He uses uh, absurd type as an example of an initial object from which everything can be derived. Well, as long as you can give me that uh, void, I can give you anything, but you can know. Yeah. Right. So some falsehood, basically. Mm -hmm. If we go into logic. Um, but pretty much every interesting logic has a principle of explosion. Like every logic that mentioned has a principle of explosion. You need to go to into really strand logic if you don't want it. Per consistent logic and stuff, yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. This is what I was going to say. I had seen Jensen calculus. Actually, this was the first time I think the penny dropped for me on Jensen calculus and, and uh, cut elimination and stuff. I had seen this any number of times and the, somehow it didn't click until this one. Yeah, this, uh, this is exactly how these pure type systems are, are written in terms of like all of these deductions. Yeah, as I was saying before uh, any other people joined, uh, this notation with trees of proofs uh, is used quite a lot in uh, computer science uh, well, papers and some talks. Uh, the one uh, talk and probably a paper, I'm not sure, which I was uh, thinking the most about is uh, computer science meta notation. It joins things like regular expressions, said uh, Vim, and well, computer science notation. So I really, I really want to rewatch it yet another time. Computer science meta notation. You won't be disappointed, I think, if you appreciate computer science at all. Okay, uh, it it's on YouTube. Uh, I'll link it afterwards if you want. Where? where okay. uh, I'll link it afterwards. Where will you link yeah, it? It's, it's, it's actually by guy still, so yeah, it's probably below. 
a second. Okay. All right. I can just flip, stop. Okay. Guy Steele is one of my favorites. I'm going to put that there just in case that's the right one. Oh, thanks. Um, Yeah, so there were some asymmetries in the logic that goes into the sort of I'm used to. And then uh, linear. Yeah, Jensen wrote down the inference rules suitable for the intuitive propositional calculus and predicate calculator. These rules lack the mirror symmetry of the classical case. But in the 1980s, the symmetry was restored by Girard's invention of linear logic. <clears throat> this is where you get these, these uh, um, connectives that I'm still getting used to. I was really um, impressed by uh, the sentence on the second to last paragraph on your page, I mean on your screen, uh, that uh, not only classical logic can be embedded into intuanistic in Forgive me, uh, but also into shinistic logic can also be embedded in into shinistic linear logic. Jesus, man. Yeah, me too. I think that was the first time that I really understood that, like, all of these, you know, sort of logical forms that look more and more complicated. And it looks like you're adding things. Um, you're you're not really losing anything in the in the lower categories and you're just like developing these more fine-grained distinctions about like the method in which things are proved i guess uh, oh, the, that was pretty cool the closest analogy or an actual application of it which i'm thinking about for the second time is uh, how rust uses linear types uh, to actually have some uh, checks on memory allocation. They, you can borrow, you can own, uh, and this improves uh, memory management so much uh, that they actually implement it despite it being one of the most difficult parts of Rust language for novices. And another commercial for Idris there, by the way, Idris has linear types. Idris too. Yeah, linear types are great. And the, my point is like, yeah, you can do your dirty magic, but if you want, you can have linear types. Yep. And I saw a talk by Simon Payton Jones where he uh, proposed a way to implement linear types in Haskell. But yeah. last I checked, it was not implemented in GH yet. There is a merge request. Um, this part, okay, there's another form of the cut rule. If we have some intermediate step, we can just ignore it. I mean, it also looks like modus ponens and stuff, but the first form of the cut rule they showed was, was... That's not quite mod modus ponens, as I understood. There is a form oh, sorry, yeah, it's not. Well, wait a minute. If Yeah, anyway. Uh, modus ponens is introduced as EV uh, shorthand uh, below, I think, uh, below uh, before we get to the uh, proof trees. Uh, you'll see it because it uh, follows from empty, well, proposition. Uh, slightly oh, below. by the way. <laughs> Double line re means that the inverse rule also holds. Has anybody found a math jacks way to do double line? I've searched for a long time and couldn't figure out a way. Anyway. Uh, and if anyone wants to explain to me B and C, I would gladly appreciate it because it's the least intuitive of them all for me. I kind of get uh, the rest of those, the rest. They have their um, an analogies, at least. Uh, B is symmetry, so it's not that surprising. 
that if you've got an X and an Y, it's the same as having an Y and an X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 obviously, okay. B symmetry, yes, I see that. Uh, it's just the symbol soup. It's diffi difficult to learn notation and uh, new type of logic and how it all connects to categories. Right, yeah. yeah. So in, in C, you have, if you have both an X and a Y, which is what the tensor is, it's just like putting things next to each other. Um, and from that, you can get Z. Then that means um, that you can actually, so that, that in a programming language would look like, like a function type from um, X and Y to Z. Um, oh, then you can pass it, hmm? pair, yeah, pair, well, no. That's just function type from you give me an X, you give me a Y next oh. to each other, I give you a Z. And then from that, if you can give it an X and get the like curried function, um, you give me a Y, I will give you a Z. That's what that's saying. Uh, I'm sorry, can you... Got you... The ex you've got the exact same rule in classical, well, I mean, in classical and intuitionistic logic where you replace the product by the... A conjunction and the special arrow by the implication. So it's just saying that the special arrow is pretty, it's the implication for this strange product. Yeah, I've read that this is basically curry, but uh, despite being quite familiar with currying, uh, well, not in practice maybe, but in theory I'm very comfortable reading about it and seeing it in code, but here I just don't see it maybe. As I say, it's mostly problem with uh, unfamiliar yeah. notation. Yeah, it's just staring at things and working through your brain and stuff like that. I think what helps me is seeing x lolly z as like a function name almost. So it's like the x is sort of now just like embedded into the function. x curry z is like... Oh, it clicked. Okay, okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to actually give um, the intuition for it uh, while I can. So, uh, as, as was said, we have a tensor of X and Y. So we have X and Y lying together. And from that, we can get that. Uh, Z. This means that uh, if I only have Y, I just need to put X next to it. Then I'll get that. Basically. Uh -huh. That's why it's curry. Yeah, it's it's almost almost that. It's if you only have x, so you've supplied x to the function already in that example, in that notation, because you need a y still to get your result z. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I retained my y, which was laying around, so because I only had y. Uh, that's what I said. So I just have to complete the tensor. And then I'll be fine. I'll get my Z. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I love those proof trees. They're so compact, beautiful. Uh, but you need to, well, read them quite a few times before yeah. you get familiar and comfortable. But after, but after that, they really shine. I'm not Thanks. sure compact compactness of those proof is so good. If you try to write a proof tree for something non-trivial, it takes like pages and pages and pages. Well, what if you weren't using tree structure of those proofs and instead you were writing them like you could see in repetitional logic? They're good for, for the schematic you know, explanation of the rules, but when you actually write a proof, maybe not so much. Mm. So mostly for reading and uh, reading and not for writing, is that what you mean? Well, no, what I mean is that they are good for the rule, showing the rule, but when you're actually applying the rule and applying the rule many times to construct a proof, maybe that notation is not so concise. Yeah, but what I got from that is that you don't really need much um, reading of the details if you can just read. Oh, yeah, that applies modern exponents. I know what that means uh, right here because I'm following along. And I can just uh, skip or skim through and not uh, be buried in details because the structure is right here, right on the page. We see a few uh, below which are kind of branching. It's, it's really nice. And 
there's always uh, the definition used in the brackets. Yeah. Right. Races, what, whatever. <laughs> in the parentheses. <laughs> So what I was saying b before about uh, stock on computer science meta notation, uh, oh, it doesn't use. Pause for just a sec. I'm wondering if I've missed anybody. I was going to go around more. Um, hold on. Who have we not heard from? Isaac, you had an idea. Jake, you came up with something. I wonder, Luke, have you come with anything in particular to say? Uh, not especially, not at that point. Okay. Um, and then Craig, I don't know if I've heard from Craig. I don't have anything in particular to say at the moment. Okay. All right. Yeah, I didn't get it as organized in the discussion this week as I did in the previous, because I didn't, hadn't really done my homework. <laughs> All right. And then this thing only tells me that your name is A13PH. How, how would I say that in conversation? Um, let me repeat that uh, I'm Aleph, or if you prefer, you can call me Al for short. Okay, Aleph. All right, great. All right, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, no problem. It's a tangent tangent anyway but the talk uh, by guy still uh, he doesn't use uh, very big uh, proof trees but still they use uh, same or at least similar uh, notation of um, well the part above the part below and the line to represent that uh, it follows uh, it's really difficult at first but uh, this made it click for me so okay Everybody's seen MetaMath, right? Oh, what is this? This huge library of, of actual proofs. I think I saw some collections of proofs hey. from like the basic uh, theorems, uh, from axioms, I mean, yeah, to basic is... theorems and to some very complicated ones. Yeah. So they exist. I think it's um, not some singular. Uh, library. I think there are a few of them, but I'm not sure it was very long ago. If you can link it, I would appreciate it. MetaMath has huge parts of just, you know, the stuff you learned in school mechanized. Now I lost my... Uh, ah. Okay, yeah. Oh. Good side take on. I approve. Um, okay, then we start talking about how you can't just take a thing and duplicate it in real life, nor can you get destroy it easily. I didn't, I was skimming at this point. Yeah, if you st uh, if you thought uh, four uh, different uh, science branches wasn't enough, here's some chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but it does drive the point home that uh, in chemistry you can just make stuff up from the thin air, and you can just get rid of uh, things you don't want. Like you have to recycle them somehow. It also con connects the Roland query language to drug discovery. So. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, can you expand a little bit, uh, maybe? Right, well, um, so drug discovery, you're trying to take lots of possible molecules and see how they would interact with diseases. And so one way to do it is to synthesize the molecule, stick it next to the bad thing and see what happens. Another way to do it is in silico. They simulate it. You know, they, they make 3D oh. models of these things. Yeah. And um, you can do this stuff with Pi calculus and linear logic and stuff and do huge simulations and treat it as a query language. And at least that's the theory. Well, I guess some of it, to some extent, it's, it's practice. There are published papers doing it. 
I was thinking you were mentioning because of uh, various folding phase uh, yeah. of molecules. Yeah. And that's a part of it, I guess. But sometimes it's just difficult to predict uh, without complicated algorithms what will happen when you put some strange molecules together. Yep. What? Oh, it's a not follow symbol, right? Yes. It's kind of convoluted, but okay. <laughs> Most chemists don't think about any matter very often, but particle physicists do. This is part, a big motivation for me of of taking this time on the Rosetta Stone is that Greg says he's cracked the ladle proof theory and, and he I was on the phone and he was explaining things and you know it's going like 18 levels above my head I just wanted to climb three levels up um, and so this is the part where I should have been really diving in but I've been juggling too much but this is where it gets into Lavier theories and stuff right oh Lavier theory I didn't catch that mm, uh, not very much oh really no that yeah Lavier theories are different. Uh, they w. VW. Law. I, think. I don't think they are even mentioned in this paper. What? Uh, w, w, yes. How do you I think spell there is a V before the W. Yeah, but you oh, No, I was wrong. Oh, no, it's W before the V. Oops. Yeah, that one. Oh, it is mentioned four times. Yeah, that was way up there. But oh, that's this is what I was, yeah. Uh... Yeah, that's way over my head. <laughs> So you use these when you're like translating semantics. Yeah, like, that's what you... I got from that. Like this is another uh, less pocket version of translation between uh, this time category theory and various uh, logical systems. And it's nice to have this uh, ladder of semantics basically. Uh, yeah, but Lavier theories are specifically used, I think, when you're um, when you're looking at uh, like you're generating grammar, grammar for a logic, or for whatever. So when you're when you're actually like translating, um, you know, when you're looking like going from a monoid to like a category of w in, into like the multi-category. So I think they they explain Lavier theories pretty well in the um, introduction to the uh, uh, what was the paper the the Categorical semantics of the pi calculus or row calculus. Oof. Well, that's categorical semantics of row calculus is the namespace theory, right? Name, namespace logic. Mm. Mm. Uh, Bartosh has some good explanations of Lavier theories. He's got a great video on YouTube that explains them. Um. This is that's what I know of is the semantics for row, the logic for row calculus. Does namespace mean what I think it means? It doesn't, is it? <laughs> it well, it's a pod calculus has channels or names, and it's a set of names or channels or whatever. Is this the paper you were thinking of? Uh, I don't okay. think so. Okay. No, you're, you're talking about the paper by Greg and Mike, right? I think I'm maybe talking about the two categorical approach to the pi calculus. Or, so that is the higher dimensional rewriting. Wait. And then there's all this stuff, stuff about Scott's domain theories that I will hope that's another like, Greg just flips that around like everybody's got their in their back pocket. I'm like, wait, hold on. <laughs> Ooh, I think I'm going to get into that in this Linda Calculus book pretty soon. I think that's chapter 14. 
That sounds like the kind of thing that takes me 18 months to absorb. <laughs> Uh, the first 13 chapters are no joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what uh, are we talking about? Lambda calculus and combinatorial logic. Oh, is that one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've only done some basic lambda calculus. Uh, actually from Haskell from first principles and I actually quite enjoy it, even calculating it. Despite me being stanch uh, detractor from the whole uh, calculating in math. Computers should do calculations. Is this? Yeah, Dana Scott, okay. Anyway, this domain theory is... theory is that when you try to define, uh, I, I had a course on it a few years ago. If you try to define semantics for lambda calculus, you've got this problem that it needs to be closed in some way. That is, you need to the functions are also objects mm -hmm. in untyped lambda calculus. But if you take a set and you want your set to be, uh, and you want like the, the function from the set to itself to be injected in the set, it forces the set to be, uh, to be empty, I think, or like a singleton. Like the, it's the only set where it's possible. So like the domain theory is trying to uh, apply restriction to the function you consider while still proving that when you uh, spont like um, naively try to apply semantics, you only get that kind of function. That was completely unclear. Uh, as I say, like, you know, if you, Basically, the, the set of functions from a set to itself is much bigger than every set, right? oh. which is not the singleton. But in lambda calculus, if you want like um, semantics from, from the lambda terms, like a function from lambda terms to lambda terms is also lambda terms. So you need a way to like inject the function from the domain of the semantics to itself into the domain of semantics. Hmm, okay. But that's something that's not possible if you just consider arbitrary function and arbitrary sets. And like the domentary by Scott is trying to uh, restrict the functions the right way to get this property working. Okay. If you want in the next like one minute that we have left, I could um, give a brief little glance at the cut elimination theorem in Idris for the sequence. Yeah, I was going to ask about that earlier, but somehow it didn't seem like the time. I was hogging too much time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. All right, do you see a screen? I do. Um, yeah, so the idea is we have this uh, we have the notion of a proposition, um, which we have like a, yeah, we have a notion of a proposition and then we have a notion of a sequent, which sort of like pushes propositions together. Um, so our, we take a proposition to a proposition to a type, and this is a sequent that is only um, like multiplicitous on the right-hand side, not on the left-hand side. Okay. I believe that's the case. Um, but anyways, in any, in any case, we have this data type for our sequent, and then we have this data type for our cut-free sequent, which has all of the rules except for cut in it. Mm -hmm. And then um, we want to be able to go from two cut-free sequents, from a cut-free sequent from A to B and a cut-free sequent from B to C to a cut-free sequent from A to C, which essentially just tells you... Um, that yeah, if you have if you have two cut free sequence, you can compose them together, mm -hmm. um, and then cut elimination then um, is just essentially this translation from your sequent data type to cut free sequent data type, um, and the translation is pretty straight straightforward um, when you get to yeah. So so ma 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 mainly this is just like pretty much a direct translation, right, of data types, except for the, um, this like cut immiscible rule when you have your cut data type, then that's when you need to go back and you need to inspect 
Um, so you look up back up here at cut admissible, um, and it's actually removing the cut from uh, from the sequent type. Hmm. Um, and it was uh, it was pretty cool that Idris was able to tell that this was a total function because you know to make these rules more compact, you know I'm doing wild things like pattern matching on if either side is ID. So now I don't have to worry about ID being either side when I'm doing this. Right. Um, that's that sort of thing, which is pretty nice. So, yeah. That is cool. cool. Yep. And then you can do fun things like um, have essentially create this new like ID um, data type where to this like atomic identity which you can use to um, specify the completeness of these logical rules, meaning that like you can't um, you can't get any sequence in there which like which should look provable but is not provable in your language um, in your logical language. Uh, those lectures that I linked earlier from uh, Frank. Uh, go into more detail on that but mm -hmm. yeah essentially we've proven some sort of consistency consistency and completeness for the small form of sequent logic that we have okay. by having both cut elimination and this um identity expansion i was gonna say i thought you, surely you can't prove consistency of interest there was whose theorem is it that you can't do that no yeah ah anybody know it's gonna mm -hmm. bug me which theorem? You can't prove the consistency of formal system X in formal system X if if give unless formal system X is pretty trivial. Uh, Who is Gödel? No, yeah, it's the second incompleteness theorem by Gödel. Oh, okay. I thought it was somebody else. All right. Uh, there are several uh, of them in different systems, and they all are basically the same. So. Okay, well, this was fun, guys. Um, I'm going to leave it to somebody else to figure out what happens next week. Sounds good. Ciao. See ya. See ya.